Hi, I'm Elise Glennon with New Jersey Sharing Network. The Transplant Games of America are coming to New Jersey in the summer of 2020, and we encourage you to learn more about organ and tissue donation. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. The New Jersey Education Association. The law firm of Gibbons, PC. PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. The Northward Center. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and AM 970, The Answer. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We are, in fact, coming to you from the Agnes Farris NJDV studio in Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. We are pleased to welcome State Senator Linda Greenstein, who represents the 14th Legislative District, which is where? It is in central Jersey, near Princeton, near Trenton, that whole area around there. Senator, we thank you for coming all the way up to uh, Newark. Let's jump right into this. We just had Mayor Roz Baraka check our website to see that interview. Much of that discussion was about the Newark water crisis. But it is not just Newark, it is other older communities with older pipes, with lead pipes, potential issues. We don't want to scare anyone. Mm -hmm. But there's a joint legislative task force on drinking water infrastructure created in 2016. What is it and how is it related to this whole discussion of water? Well, that was a task force that really is over already. Um, we presented a, a wonderful report to the legislature. It's on our legislative web page. Um, and it talks about all of the recommendations that came out of that two-year task force. Uh, originally, we were only looking at infrastructure, the age of the pipes, the fact that people don't, are not able to disclose where they are because people don't have that information, which is amazing. And um, there really was no plan to fix a lot of the pipes. So we were pushing for that. But in addition, we looked at the lead issue because this was right after Flint, Michigan, and we wanted to see what was going on here. And we weren't surprised to find out that lead is a major problem. Serious problem in New Jersey. Yes, it is. How seriously do you believe the state, and there are many state agencies, the DEP, Department of Health and others, how seriously are we taking this situation? I think we're taking it very seriously now, particularly because of the problems in Newark. Uh, I know the mayor and others are working very hard on that and pushing to make sure that something is done. Um, prior to this, we were talking in terms of, well, we will change the lead service lines, or the water service lines, I should say, within 10 years. Then it went down to three years, and I think now we're thinking even less than that. We're trying to come up with the funds to get these lines changed quickly. You know, it's interesting, Senator. We don't want to scare people. But we want to have an honest conversation. As soon as Flint gets put into this conversation, does it scare the heck out of people? Well, I think the reputation that Flint got was that um, this could happen to you. So but it's that true. was why. And it, it is true. Although there, uh, there was a particular situation where they changed their water supply and that seemed to lead to the problems. Here, we just have that aging infrastructure. Um, there are chemicals that you can put into the pipes that will take the lead away, but even that takes time. You have to flush the system. Uh, it takes time for that to work. And they're also checking as to how uh, the efficacy, if you will, of those chemicals. And Mayor Baraka talked about that as well. Right, and filters haven't even worked, and that's frightening, uh, uh, I think. Exactly. Um, the cost, go back to that. You understand fiscal issues in the state better than most. You understand constituents' response to fiscal <laughs> issues. Yes, we How do. honest can we be, should we be, in terms of saying, look, if, if you want clean water, it's going to cost us billions, and it sounds like Carl Sagan right now, I'm dating myself. Billions, billions and, billions. and billions of dollars 
to do this over a period of time, which potentially means, even with the borrowing and the bonding, Senator, potentially means significant tax increases. Yes. Do you think the public's ready for that conversation? Because you know they want clean water. Yes. Well, looking at the Newark situation, the issue is the water service lines that go from the street to the person's right. house. They're not very long. And um, the amount to fix those, while it's large, is not astronomical. It is I'm talking doable. about a statewide crisis. Oh, okay. I'm well, doing statewide, not just Newark. Yeah. If you were doing everything, it is a very large number. And Newark, um, just, just using that as an example, uh, it really is the responsibility of the homeowner, believe it or not, Wait to fix those, I, but it's, that's not how, how it's being it, done. Listen, if we're here in Newark where we're taping at NJTV. How many homeowners do you think can come up with the thousands of dollars necessary to do that? It's five to eight thousand dollars they're talking about. I don't think most people can. And that's the reason why first Essex County gave a grant. Of the, no, no, it wasn't a grant. It was $120 million. Uh, I, they mm -hmm. bonded for that over bonded a period for. of time. Yes. That the city of Newark is on the hook for. Mm. I want to be clear. But they bonded because right. Newark couldn't borrow the money on its own. Right. And individual homeowners really can't do it. There's talk about the state providing funding for this. Mm. Um, frankly, I think it's fair. While the water line is the homeowners, mm. this is not just a water line. This is a public health crisis. And in that case, I think the state should be responsible. As you're talking about a public health crisis, uh, last question I want to bring up, climate change. Not just nationally, but in New Jersey. New Jersey, this is real. Oh, it absolutely is, because we have the big shore area. Um, there are many creative things that are being looked at, um, but we absolutely have to do everything we can, first of all. Uh, the governor, in his energy master plan that he's just put out, um, the first thing he has in there is electrifying the transportation system. I'm very big with that. I've been one of the first sponsors of the electric car bills about five years ago. And they've worked that in. Um, they want to electrify buses and, and all other means of transportation. That will get rid of a lot of the greenhouse gases and, and problems that we have. For those who blow this off, no disrespect to the president. The president has said he questions some of the science of climate change. You say? I say he's wrong. <laughs> because um, I, I believe that the science does show that, uh, that this is a big problem and that we have to do something about it. A national crisis, not yes. simply state by state. Yes. And if we don't, we would have a repeat of Hurricane S or Superstorm Sandy, but on a basis that would be much larger and uh, could really decimate our shore. We don't want that to happen. It goes inland, too, so it's a major problem. Senator, how long have you been in the legislature? 20 years. Senator Linda... Greenstein, who represents uh, 14th District, which is Trenton, no, it, it outside actually, of Trenton? It's Hamilton all the way up to Spotswood over to Plainsville. 15th District is Trenton. That's right. Could you imagine it, those things in my head? That's pretty good. Well, <laughs> never mind. Uh, listen, Linda, thank you so much for joining us, Senator. Appreciate Great it. Great to be here. This thank is you. State of Affairs. She came all the way up from uh, Central Jersey to be with us. We appreciate it. We're right back on State of Affairs right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm Steve Adubato. We are on the campus of NJIT in Newark, New Jersey for the second annual Voice Summit. That's right, the largest Voice Summit in the world. And a gentleman who actually wrote about this in his publication, ROI, uh, Return on Information New Jersey, is Tom Bergeron, the editor. Tom, when I first read this article on the print side, many people read it on the digital side as well. The case for voice. Uh, you were talking to Pete Erickson. Um, when you check out all of our programs, Pete put this thing together. He's with Modev. 5,000 attendees here, 1,000 students attending on scholarship, 400 speakers and panelists, 250 programs and panels, 125 sponsors, 25 countries represented, it goes on and on. How big a deal is this? This is a huge deal. It's a huge deal for Newark. It's a huge deal for New Jersey. Uh, it, it, you can't underestimate how important this is and what it's become in just its second year. What could it mean? Break it down. Well, I'll, I'll give you three examples of why it's good. They talk about last year. Every hotel in the city sold out. 
five million dollars of economic impact. Now, I don't know how you measure economic impact, but I know in every hotel is sold, you got a lot of people here going to restaurants, going to bars, Ubers, whatever it is, it's bringing it here. Yep. That was last year. This year is doubled in size. Next year could easily be doubled in size to that. So you have those numbers right there. Then you have number two. I'm at a table down there listening to the keynote today this morning. The woman By next to me. Is Bisky? Is Bisky, yeah, Bisky. who happens to be an NJIT grad, yep. right? Went to school in Newark. Who's at my table? Two people from Australia. Okay, so what? tell me one other event this century that's going to get two people from Australia soon. to come from, to, to Australia. And, but and, why does that matter, that people why, from around the world come here? Here's why it matters, because they don't know Newark. They know what they see today, what they see this week. So if I'm an Australian company, or I'm a German company, or I'm a company from anywhere in, in the Soviet, in Russia, anywhere, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, this is your first look at Newark. And all you're saying is, this is pretty cool. This is, this is a high-tech city. First impressions matter. First impressions matter a lot. Right? So they come in, they see all of the technology you have in here, the high-speed internet you have here. That's fantastic. And what do they do? They bring it all back. So every company in the world needs to have a, a presence in New York. As far as they know, Newark is New York. And it's 10 cents on the dollar, right? When you talk about all the savings. Right. So all of these companies are going back to where they were from, and they're talking up Newark. So that's great for the city. And here's number three. You go down some of the rows here for all of the entrepreneurs. I meet these guys on Gamify. Two kids from Newark, right? You shouldn't say kids. They're 30 entrepreneurs, right? They've, they've done some apps. They decided to get in a voice. So they came up with this really cool um, product where if you're a gamer, you can clip your, your clip or whatever you want to do, send it out on social media. That all happened in Newark. So when you talk about the 1,000 kids that are here, most of these kids are Newark or Essex County kids. So what are we doing? What is this event doing? Creating, creating all the next kinds generation. Of opportunities for people going to a field that they didn't even know existed. Right. You want to talk about economic opportunity five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? I was here yesterday, you had third graders from Newark walking around at here the learning Summit. about at the Voice Summit. At the Voice public Summit. Public school kids. Public, there's no other public school in the in, uh, city in the country where 500 kids, 1,000 kids came in and learned about Voice. Let me ask you for ROI, for your publication. By the way, check out our website. We're uh, media partners with ROI. Deciding to cover an event like this and putting it on the front page, voice activated, and then you've got two articles here, one about the voice summit and also about the connection to NJIT and what it means right. to disclose again. NJIT is one of our high, uh, higher education media partners. I just want to put that out there. How do you actually make a decision, A, to cover it, and B, how do you cover it because it's so big? It's so big, it's so broad, and how does it affect New Jersey business, right? So we do two ways. We found about it last year. We came last year. We said if a major international event business event is going to come to Newark, we're going to cover it because that's the kind of stuff that we do. Now, how do we find a way to cover it where we talked to someone yesterday, I talked to someone at Realogy, right? Realogy, a real estate company, okay. right? Madison, right? Huge company. W what do they have to do with voice? I'm wondering, why are they here? They're, well, they're here because they, they got into voice about six months ago. This month, they're introducing Agent X, they're calling it, a voice activated system for all their realtors. On, they figured out how voice works for them. So we write the story and we talk about how did Realogy find out about it? Surprise, surprise, they actually talked to their employees and mm. said, what do you need? How does this work? So we try to present this to the New Jersey business community. Someone saying, ah, voice doesn't, doesn't apply to me. Yeah. It does, it applies to everything. So we're sort of planting the seed for other companies that maybe you should look into that. The other thing about ROI um, is that they do policy. They examine policy questions and issues. We don't do a lot of politics. You only look at politics as a con in terms of this how politics impacts policy, which impacts the business community and all of us. There's a point here, trust me. We just had an interview with an attorney that talked about the questions and challenges for all of us in society in regulating and managing confidentiality, um, access to information, financial and personal in voice, and that government agencies, policymakers, be they elected or appointed, are so far behind oh, on this. Oh, a, a generation Is, behind. Okay, do you see that as an area that ROI potentially looks at and says, hey, wait a minute, we saw this going on, we saw the tip of the iceberg, you have a responsibility to do these things. But do they even know what that means? They don't, they don't what, understand. Excuse me, what's the committee in the state legislature or in the United States Congress that would be prepared to, load a question I know, Examine these issues. They, could, they couldn't examine Facebook when they had the chance. They were, they yeah, were unfamiliar we with there. that, right? So how are they going to do some of this technology, which is all six months, 12 months, 18 months old? 
right? So that's a nice challenge for Frank and the guys at Gibbons on how do you get By ahead way, Frank, of all you know, that. Frank, you're talking about, check out that conversation. Is it part of your job to put pressure on these officials to get into this space and deal with it? I wouldn't use the word pressure. I would use the word, um, we want to bring uh, we want to bring it to light. We want to let them know that it's out there. We want to let them know the issues that people are facing, whether it's regulatory issues. When you get an economic development, you can talk about incentive issues, and let's not go to the incentive game. You can talk about all of the different rules and regulations they would have on high-speed fiber and how it works, this and that, and show how this will impact whether these companies that we're talking about sure. are going to come to New Jersey and come to Newark. What do we have that works and doesn't work? Final so our question. job will be just to shed light on it. Final question. Um, so there are folks who say, well, uh, your publication, what we do in public broadcasting and all of our other platforms on Fios and uh, the NPR systems who carry us as well, as well as our friends at uh, AM 970 in New York. Yeah, well, that's for a bunch of insiders. That's for people who follow politics and government and business. And that's not the average person. It seems to me the average person is affected by is dealing with and consumes voice technology. This is not an insider game. Right. And people don't realize how much voice technology is taking over their lives already. Some of the speakers today are talking about where it goes from this year and three years back and five years back. You don't understand how much you do it. it but once you start doing it and you start seeing how helpful it is and how conversational, how natural it is, more and more companies are coming into it and more and more consumers are gonna see it in their daily life whether they realize it first or not. Right now, it might just be setting their thermostat, right? Or getting a drink of water and making sure that, or telling someone to start the coffee maker. But more and more is coming every day, so it impacts everybody. Tom Bergeron is the editor of ROI, Return on Information, New Jersey. Again, to disclose, they're one of our media partners. Hey, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Voice Summit in Newark, New Jersey, and NJIT. This is big stuff. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. That's right, we are at MetLife Stadium for the Celebrating Life and Liberty event. You can hear the music playing in just a, about an hour or so. There will be about 6,000 people here. We're honored to be talking to uh, Robert Garrett. Bob Garrett is CEO. So we're actually going to be doing a half-hour special on this event, talking to uh, survivors, family members, um, clinicians, others who are part of this event. But right now we want to talk to Bob about some uh, important healthcare issues. So if I say to you, Trends in healthcare. Big picture, you say? Big picture, I'd say uh, first and foremost, I'd say that consolidation in the healthcare industry continues to mergers? accelerate. Mergers, acquisitions, affiliations, partnerships. Uh, we've seen a lot of it. We're going to continue to see that happen. I think it's actually not a bad thing. I think it's actually a very, very good thing because when um, health systems can consolidate and can merge, you can share best practices. So clinical care can improve. You can also um, not duplicate services and um, reach some efficiencies and some synergies. So hopefully healthcare becomes more affordable, more accessible. You get to a certain size and scale that you're able to reinvest in the communities that we serve. So um, those, those trends are gonna continue to happen. I think the market just continues to change. It's gonna be really hard for the the, um, the old time community hospital, the freestanding community hospital to really be able to survive without at least an affiliation, at least a partnership, if you not. You need scale. Yeah, you need the scale to really um, survive. The other big trend that I see, Steve, is um, healthcare. We, we know that more and more healthcare is being provided outside of the four walls of the hospital. So, you know, you see more ambulatory care uh, popping up, whether it's retail healthcare um, centers, surgery centers, fitness and wellness centers. But now the big trend is really toward home care. Home and, care. Yes. And the future of healthcare is really healthcare being delivered in the home with the right technology. And um, that's, that's really going to be key because, um, and it's almost like what goes around comes around. I mean, if you think about back in the, the Middle Ages, um, that's where healthcare was really being delivered in the home. It's going back to the home, but this time it's going to be with technology. So. Well, hold on, Bob. I'm curious yeah. about this. The technology part of it. Yes. Let's talk about innovation a lot. Actually, check out our website. You'll see the entire series we're doing innovation. With the innovation, with the technology, but go back 
doctors or physicians would come to your house, you know, we'd think the old right. school bag, right? You and I are too young to remember that. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, the technology with physicians and clinicians, how do you keep the human connection? So it's gonna be through a virtual uh, connection. So through your smartphone where you can receive health information, you can actually get physician consults through telehealth, through telemedicine. That's really gonna be where the connection is. And you know, where it's actually already happening, uh, patient um, satisfaction is actually improving because physicians are, and, and other providers are spending more quality time with patients as opposed to being rushed in a crowded office where you, know, you have office hours, a certain, you know, certain number of minutes, a certain number of hours, and you know, there's a big backup and the physicians, you know, they wanna spend more time with their patients, but they really can't because they got a office full of people. This way, they can really schedule these, these so-called virtual home visits um, at different times during the day. We're seeing actually uh, where, it's, where it's happening now, uh, patient experience is actually improving. Kaiser Permanente, out on the West Coast in California, almost half of all of their visits now, their physician-patient visits, are done um, through telehealth and telemedicine. Not face-to-face. -face. Not face-to-face. -face. And, 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 and patients, many, are saying, we're good with this? We're good with this, yeah. And um, even in the hospital. So good examples are we have shortages in certain uh, specialties, like in psychiatry. So if a patient needs a psychiatric consultation. Excuse me, but telepsychiatry? Tele telepsychiatry. So in community hospitals, in communities where psychiatrists are in short supply, a patient can, on a timely basis, get a psychiatric consultation while they're in the hospital, because they might wait otherwise a day, two days, or three days for that psychiatric consultation. Much more efficient, much more, um, much better for the patients if they get it on a timely basis. The other thing that's happening, and we're just opening for the first time, a behavioral health urgent care center. And through behavioral health urgent care, uh, patients will be able to get uh, telepsychiatry uh, visits in that setting as well. So instead of patients having to go into a crowded emergency department, uh, wait for sometimes hours, if not days, for psychiatric consultation, they can get almost an instantaneous consultation in a uh, behavioral health urgent care center. First one opening in September um, in uh, Neptune, New Jersey. Innovation is not a choice. It's something that goes on on a regular basis, has to happen, particularly responding to patient demands and needs. The other thing is I want to talk a little bit about, Bob, Bob and I have talked about leadership a lot, and to fully disclose, I do uh, leadership uh, and communication coaching within the network, and also your network is one of the big supporters of uh, what we're doing in public broadcasting. But I'm curious about this. Mergers, you started talking right. about that. I did. Hackensack Meridian. <clears throat> How many years in now? We're three years in. Okay, if I said to you, number one lesson you've learned and that others should learn or could learn from the merger you say is? I'd say the number one lesson is focus on integration, particularly cultural integration. What, is that? what do you mean integration? So here's what I mean is you, could, you can have a merger and yet these hospitals can still be independent entities, almost like a confederation of hospitals, very loose. Or you can have a highly integrated system where you do share those best practices and clinical care improves or you, uh, you put all the health records on one electronic health uh, record system. Easier That's, said than done. It's easier said than done. It's hard work, but the integration pays off because if you're really gonna get the benefits of being a healthcare system or a healthcare network, you have to integrate. And you can have the best strategies in the world, but if you don't have a unified culture that's strong and united and everybody's aligned in the same way, guess what? Those strategies are not gonna survive. You're not gonna be successful. So getting one culture when you have 35,000 team members and um, 8,500 providers is not an easy, uh, easy task. You gotta work at it constantly. So the lesson learned is, you know, you can't integrate too much. You can't focus on culture too much. Um, you know, not that strategy is easy to either develop or execute. But culture? But, but culture, culture is, uh, is, is what's gonna sustain you. Everything could look fine on paper. Right. Right? The numbers look right, economies of scale, we can save money, we can provide better patient care. But if you don't come together as human beings and work together, it doesn't work, no matter what the numbers look like. That, that's absolutely right. It's, you know, it's kind of uh, an old adage about, it's, it's about people, right? And uh, people aren't aligned if they don't have the same focus, the same mission, the same vision, the same values. And we, re we redid everything at Hackensack Meridian. We wanted to give our mission a fresh look, a fresh uh, way of uh, people identifying with it. We have a new vision, we have um, some core values, and we do various events um, in person, virtually, to really get our team 
members really align with that mission, vision, values. Communication, shooting, it's communicating not easy with that many people. Not that easy. So, you know, Steve, one of the things that we do is in addition to rounding, in addition to a lot of events I do in person, um, like the event here at MetLife Stadium, uh, we do have virtual town hall meetings as well. So we uh, we do them like three or four times a year and uh, we show them to team members all around the network at their convenience, not at our convenience, because they're, you know, our, our physicians, our nurses, our technicians are working hard every every day. And we wanna make sure that when when they're ready to hear the message, we can deliver it and you can do that virtually. I, it doesn't take the place of being there in person, but it, it's a great method when you have 35,000 team members at 500 different locations. For those of you watching State of Affairs, you're used to seeing us in the studio or out here on location. This is the Celebrating Life and Liberty event here at MetLife Stadium. And um, Bob, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Steve. Ha thanks for having me. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, the New Jersey Education Association, the law firm of Gibbons PC, PSENG, the North Ward Center, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and AM 970, The Answer. I think at NJIT, there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state, it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion.